All right, we're ready to start. Welcome to our third monthly virtual society meeting for the American Chesterton Society. Uh, this is a new format from uh, our previous two attempts, and I hope that you uh, will find it much more user-friendly. That is our goal. You don't have to use uh, six different devices at once to participate. You don't have to be on the phone, on the television, on your two handhelds, and uh, the uh, have the uh, diesel engine running at the same time. So it's very simple. If you if you uh, would like to participate in the chat room, that's supposed to be running theoretically right next to this. I hope it is because it's not on my screen. But is it, is it working on your screen? It was working on Emily's screen, so we count on her. But also you can email Emily if you have any feedback. Email Emily DeRotstein, emily at chesterton.org if you have any uh, specific uh, feedback or questions. But do uh, put some questions into the chat room, and we'll try to answer those during the course of our uh, next half hour together here. Uh, all right, so our agenda for this evening, we're going to talk about some of Chesterton's reflections on Advent and Christmas. That'll be the main thing uh, that we'll be doing. But first, we have to begin with advertisements. All right, you are going to be getting in the mail, if you have not already gotten, a beautiful little Chesterton Society Christmas catalog. And uh, there's some neat uh, Chesterton products in there. Of course, we, we're selling the uh, the book that I just uh, got published uh, by Ignatius Press, The Complete Thinker, which is selling very well, by the way, and thank you for your support on that, and I'm very grateful to Ignatius Press with all the uh, support they've put behind it. The book's going really well. It's been very well received. But there's some other neat books in there that are also available. Uh, the Soul of Wit, Chesterton on Shakespeare, has just been published by Dover uh, Publications. Uh, they just told me a couple days ago that the books are being shipped. We're anxious to see that one. Uh, the uh, the real one of the real highlights of the catalog is this book. How far is it to Bethlehem? Uh, edited by Nancy Brown. It's the poetry and plays of Francis Chesterton, Gilbert's beloved wife. Uh, a book like this is. A complete surprise because we didn't know about the existence of much of this material till Nancy dug it up and it's a marvelous piece of scholarship just discovering this but it gives us a wonderful insight into Chesterton and uh, the woman he shared his life with who truly a, a remarkable devout uh, Catholic woman who was so devoted to the uh, the nativity uh, all, a, a fact all the more pointed by the fact that she could not have children herself. I want to read one poem from from this collection. Obviously the most famous poem in there is the title poem, and I, I was tempted to read that, but here's another one that is almost as famous, because it, uh, like How Far Is It to Bethlehem, uh, this poem has been made into uh, a famous Christmas carol, arranged by the English composer Herbert Howells. And the title of the poem is, Here is the Little Door. Here is the little door, lift up the latch, O oh lift. We need not wander more, but enter with our gift, our gift of finest gold, gold that never was bought or sold, myrrh to be strewn about his bed, incense in clouds about his head, all for the child that stirs not in his sleep, but holy slumber holds with ass and sheep. Bend low about his bed, for each he has a gift. See how his eyes awake. Life up, lift up your hands, O oh lift. For gold he gives a keen-edged sword. Defend with it thy little lord. For incense, smoke of battle red. Myrrh for the honored, happy dead. Gifts for his children, terrible and sweet. Touched by such little hands, and oh, such tiny feet. A uh, really sweet uh, poem. Ch uh, Chesterton's wife, Frances, obviously had this connection with children, and her uh, her poems not only uh, reach children at their level, but, but they, it lifts the children up to a higher level. 
as it does with the ch the child in us all. So that's a wonderful book to get. Something I'm sure you don't have makes a great gift. Everything in there makes a great gift. Um, I uh, want to mention the one sleeper book that's in there that may easily be overlooked, and that's the uh, the final uh, installment of the Illustrated London News essays. It's finally been published. The essays from 1935 to 1936. What's great about this volume is that it includes uh, um, an index to the subjects that Chester writes about throughout the Illustrated London News for all 31 years uh, of of his uh, essays. Great, excuse me, great collection and uh, I've been reading those lately. I, I read them a long time ago before they came out in book form when they were in uh, Frank Petta's uh, uh, Xerox copies. So, great stuff. And, and, if you purchase something from our Christmas catalog online, uh, make a gift of, uh, a, a purchase of $25 or more, or a gift of $25 or more, or join or renew your membership to the American Chester and Society you get this CD, the Chesterton Minute. The Chesterton Minute, I, I did 55 of those one-minute episodes for uh, Catholic radio stations around the country, and now we've collected them all on a CD, and you get it free if you uh, make a purchase of over $25 or renew your membership. So do that online at chesterton.org or give us a call, 800-343-2425. Two four two five or something like that. I think that's pretty close to the right number. All right, one more announcement before I uh, talk about Chesterton on Christmas and Advent. Um, we we are very pleased to announce you you know this is coming, but we are planning to have the uh, Chesterton conference this summer in Worcester, Massachusetts, at um, Assumption College. It's good. the dates are. August 1st through 3rd, 2013, and uh, the theme of this year's conference is the Chesterton Solution, Education, Economics, and Everything Else, the Chesterton Solution. We've got some good speakers lined up, a few that we can't announce yet because they haven't quite confirmed, but since it's East Coast, we might get a couple of, uh, you know, biggish names because they don't have to drive so far. So uh, please uh, plan on, on joining us in August in Worcester. All right. Got some, got some comments to make here about, uh, about Christmas. Obviously, it's not Christmas, it's Advent. We forget that. That's one of the first things we forget about at this time of year. We forget that uh, we are waiting for Christmas. We're looking forward to it. We're anticipating. We are we are waiting for Christ to come. And uh, the problem is that we are inundated in our culture with Christmas even while we're waiting for it. Uh, as a result, it's sometimes easy for us to forget that Christmas begins at Christmas. And uh, it's the, that's the feast day. And the feast then continues for 12 days after that. The rest of the world, by the time Christmas finally arrives, is thoroughly tired of Christmas. The decorations come down immediately from the halls and the malls. And uh, everyone is quite happy when the Christmas carols uh, stop in, in the piped-in uh, convenience stores and, uh, and, and every place else where we hear them. And then instead of feasting for 12 days, most people begin their fast at that point. So they, they have it completely backwards. Uh, they begin their diets. Uh, we're supposed to be dieting now in anticipation of, of Christ coming before the feast. But as with most things, the world has it exactly backwards. It's why Chesterton is always so paradoxical when he talks about anything, because the world has it backwards and expects things exactly the opposite of, of what it should. But even though our culture does everything it can to get Christmas wrong, the fact is it cannot avoid Christmas. It can criticize it, it can caricature it, but it can't get around it. The coming of Christ, as Chesterton points out in The Everlasting Man, changed the world entirely.
everything in history changes because of that event. And the other element, of course, with Christmas is that the coming of Christ also meant the coming of the Catholic Church. What the world most wishes to avoid at this time is the plain fact that Christmas is Catholic. Chesterton says Christmas means Christmas. It means what it says. It consists of two of the most provocative and controversial words in the world. Christ and Mass. One, says Chesterton, provoking crucifixion, and the other provoking persecution. Now these don't sound like normal Christmas sentiments, do they? But as Chesterton also points out in, in Orthodoxy, when the Church creates a holy day for God, it also creates a holiday for men. It's both a very divine affair, but also a very human affair. And what's interesting, of course, with Chesterton's writing <clears throat> is that he uh, re writes for a secular audience generally and will always find a way to bring in an eternal message, always point to the gospel somehow, always bring out a Christian truth in whatever secular uh, topic he, he seems to be writing about. There's always this eternal reference point. The irony is that it, when he writes about Christmas, he does really just the opposite. Christmas is already a, a very religious subject. And so what Chesterton does is he emphasizes the secular elements. Uh, he, uh, he, he takes just the opposite approach. He, um, I, I want to say he, he, he brings out the non-liturgical elements surrounding Christ's Mass. So, one of the things he does, and, and he does this really in order to make us think about Christmas in a new way. He's always trying to get us to, to have a new perspective, a fresh perspective of something that we think we already know. To get us to look at the same thing over and over again and eventually see it for the first time. It's a ch classic Chesterton technique. So one of the things Chesterton says about Christmas, for instance, is he says that Christmas is both conservative and liberal. All right, I just hit two more hot button words. But Chesterton cautions us, in this case, not to capitalize the two words. He says, Christmas conserves the traditions of our fathers, but it also inspires us to give with liberality to our brothers. It's an occasion when we admit the importance of all of our local and domestic traditions, but it's also a time where we admit that we have to help others, and especially the poor. In other words, says Chesterton, Christmas, being a Christian institution, contains in itself already the two alternative actions towards society, the preservation of what is good in the past and the removal of what is bad in the present. These two things involve, logically, the two balancing truths. Truths that are complementary, though they often seem contradictory. That in one sense, things shall be as they were, while in the other sense, they are not as they should be. Perfect Chesterton paradox. We, uh, we rejoice at Christmas, we celebrate these great traditions, and yet at the same time we're aware that things are not what they should be exactly. There's things we need to do to fix a broken world. And of course accompanying these two truths, these two complementary yet contradictory truths, are the two precise wrong reactions to both of them. Chester says there are those who sneer at the traditions and that there are, there are those who snarl at the works of charity and mercy. There's always this danger that uh, the vision of Christian peace and uh, Christmas peace, rather, and, and reconciliation uh, can easily turn into just can't. Uh, but it but it makes no sense that that when people use it, 
it makes no sense when people use the holiday to quarrel about the holiday, when they deliberately disrupt the peace and they uh, deliberately uh, banish the goodwill. Apart from the question of whether it's right or wrong for people to rebel against doctrines and religions, Chesterton says, surely, surely there's something wrong when they rebel against the liberties and the relaxations, the Christian, the Christmas customs that, if nothing else, should express the broadest brotherhood and the most boisterous exaltation. Something is wrong with the trend of thought that hates even the holidays of men. And then Chesterton says, as for those who, uh, who criticize the holiday as being artificial, he responds with another one of his paradoxes. He says, it's natural for man to be artificial. Everything about art and culture and custom is man-made. It's artificial. But it's, it's natural for us to do these things. It's all of the artificial things we do are exactly what makes us distinct from every other creature. And we don't merely do these artificial things, we, we do them in a big way. Uh, as Chesterton points out, we, we not only um, make clothes for ourselves for practical reasons, we, we make purple robes and gold capes. We not only build roofs over our head, we build temples and cathedrals. And we don't just merely eat and drink to survive. We make ale and cake and things that, that we use for enjoying life to its fullest. In breaking away from the mere cycles of nature, Chesterton says, the rhythm by which all the other unconscious creatures live, we have made a rhythm of our own with special crises and high moments of festival. Our human nature demands the artificial. It demands variety, and it demands what Chesterton calls the concentration of contentment into conviviality. In other words, a cup of Christmas cheer, which should not be indulged in until December 24th or 5th. That's when the festival begins. And then it should continue for 12 days. It's one of the great feasts of the year. And it's why we look forward to it, because it is such a great feast. But we're supposed to be waiting right now. It's a time of anticipation and advent. All right. Chesterton's Reflections on Christmas. We have some questions. Emily's going to give me some questions. All right. Did Chesterton ever write that Christmas was countercultural in the sense that it's a big feast in the darkest days of winter? I read that, and I can't remember if it's Chesterton. Well, the answer is yes. He writes about it in a couple different places, but one of, uh, one of the places is, a, is an essay called The Winter Feast. And the very fact that this is a feast in the middle of winter is, makes it a defiant act. We are defying the winter. And uh, there's something especially paradoxical and especially Christian about uh, the fire and the warmth in the midst of the, the ice and the snow. So uh, it, Chesterton uh, seizes on the, the paradoxical elements of, of Christmas. It is the feast in the winter. Another question. Uh, what would Chesterton think of a virtual Chesterton society? <laughs> well, let's uh, let's uh, let's consider that. I think uh, we know that Chesterton was a critic of new uh, technology, insofar as it it didn't really uh, serve a higher purpose so often. 
the whole idea of every tool is that it's supposed to make our life uh, uh, easier, better, more free, and uh, and the problem with so many tools that uh, that we create is that we become dependent on them, and our freedom is is a is kind of paradoxical in that we we are dependent on the tool and the tool starts to to rule us because we are so dependent on it. Now with a virtual Chesterton meeting, I, I think I think what Chesterton would uh, would point out, and I I just read this essay recently. The 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 problem um, with with the the new technology is that it it makes us forget simple pleasures, simple wonders. Uh, that that we uh, are not appreciating. If we lose our sense of wonder, of very simple communication, all the new technology in the world doesn't doesn't improve our sense of wonder, our sense of awe. And uh, he was talking about the fact that a news article was written said someday it'll be as easy to communicate with Mars as it is to talk on the telephone. And he says that's a problem because that means we are not taking um, th that that miracle of being able to talk on the telephone to someone uh, with with its appropriate sense of wonder. And uh, so so I think Chester would caution us about being too cavalier, accepting these these new things too too simply. But I think he'd also appreciate the fact that he could. Could do this thing when when Chesterton was first talking on the radio, uh, it, it was it was a it was a marvel to for him to be able to do that. He knew it, and uh, and he was natural for the radio uh, because uh, he had he he spoke in a conversational tone. Most radio announcers uh, were talking as if they were talking to a stadium full of people, and uh, he actually helped revolutionize uh, the way radio announcers spoke. So that's cool. Um, I'll, I'll have to give it some more thought of what Chester would think about uh, a, a virtual Chesterton Society meeting, but it's a great question. What would Chesterton answer the contemporary cultural canard that we Christians have simply hijacked a pagan holiday? Well, Chesterton would absolutely affirm the fact that we have taken a pagan holiday and christened it. He wouldn't use the word hijack, he'd use the word christen. Uh, that's the that's the point about paganism. Chesterton is a great admirer of the pagans, and he says then the greatest thing about paganism is that it led to Christianity. It ended in Christianity, and uh, we preserved all the all the best things of paganism and made them Christian. But uh, but to say that um, we use these pagan things is like saying well we we kept using our arms and legs. It was natural for for man to have these feasts, and that was the thing we just were were talking about um, in those reflections earlier. Those 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 special feasts are are are, are uh, a natural thing to have. Christianity just gave these things added meaning and added dimension. All right. Did Chester ever talk about the Magi and the Christmas star that went before the wise men? Well, yeah. There's a, there's a several different. Um, essays and poems about the wise men and one of them is called the wise men and it's a marvelous poem and it should be on our website and if it's not well let us know there's also a short essay of uh, a, a funny little uh, uh, dialogue between the wise men uh, called the, the the modern wise men and showing how they they utterly the, the modern wise men utterly missed the point of christmas but um, but the following the star, uh, you, you saw some references in that Francis Chesterton poem that I just read, uh, where, she, where she refers to the three gifts of the wise men, and Chesterton has a marvelous reflection on the three gifts of the wise men: uh, gold because Christ was um, a uh, a king, and uh, incense because he was a god. And myrrh because he was going to be buried, like, like a man. Um, the 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 triune element of uh, of the three gifts. Another question. Uh, next issue of Gilbert Magazine. When's it coming out? And what are the highlights? 
It is in its final process of being edited right now. I expect it to go to the printer next week, uh, probably by the end of the week. Uh, there is uh, an essay in it. The Lee Chesterton essay is one that you've never read. It's called Santa Claus and Science. Uncollected Chesterton essay. There's an interview with our distributist extraordinaire Rich Alleman, who uh, is probably one of the most interesting guys in the world. I had him over for dinner last night, and uh, he's got such an amazing story. But uh, you can look forward to that as well. A lot of good Christmas stuff in it, including a, a beautiful illustration on the cover by our artist Ted Schlunderfritz. Is there a Father Brown short story that takes place during Christmas? Oh. Is there a Father Brown short story that takes place during Christmas? I can't think of one, but I can't believe there wouldn't be. I know that um, one of his most famous Father Brown stories, The Invisible Man, takes place during the winter because snow figures heavily in it. So I want to say that there must be a Christmas element in that, but I can't think of an immediate Christmas connection. Oh, there's also a Christmas pantomime play in the in the um, short, the, the, the Father Brown story, The Flying Stars. There's a pantomime play. So that might be Christmas, but uh, yeah, I have to go do. I can't think of anything that specifically deal with a Christmas theme with the Father Brown, but those two come to mind. All right, I joined the meeting late. What can I expect at the National Chesterton Conference? You can expect the National Chesterton Conference to be August first through third, two thousand thirteen. The theme is. The Chesterton Solution, Education, Economics, and Everything Else. So, it, yeah, it, it, it's, it's going to have some famous uh, speakers who you've never heard of and some well-known speakers that are very familiar and some unknown speakers that are household names. So it's going to be great. Well, I think I think there will be an appearance by G.K. Chesterton himself as well. I know that. Anything else here? I think that's it for questions. Last call? Last call for questions. and uh, This will be archived so people can come back and share it or watch it again. We will have an archive of this episode uh, so on the website so you can watch it again. We're gonna, These things are going to keep getting better because we are starting to figure out how to do them. And, and there's less technical glitches. And we're going to just keep bringing out more fun Chesterton material and all these and so uh, one last question one last question what's your favorite online source for articles on distributism well go to the distributist review and that's got the best collection of uh, distributist articles and then of course there's some on our website as well well okay everyone have a blessed advent and thank you for joining us we're gonna do this again next month which also happens to be next year and what's the date of that meeting? It'll be Monday, January... from. We're going to do it in the second week of the month. We're going to do it the second, second week. Second Monday of January. The second Monday of January. Um, so we'll give you the whole Christmas feast to yourself. So uh, the second Monday of January the is, is the 14th. And that's going to be our next virtual Chesterton Society meeting. Our first one of 2013. Lots of good stuff coming up. Look for your uh, catalog, uh, buy Christmas gifts for people that involve G.K. Chesterton. Keep spreading the word, keep doing these good things. We're really blessed by you, we're blessed by G.K. Chesterton, and we are really blessed by the coming of Christ on Christmas Day. Good night, God bless.